Thanks for tuning into our podcast. We love having you here, and it's our mission to bring you all the latest and greatest tips, skills, and know how to make you the best that you can be. We know that you have it in you, and we're going to show you how. Now, now let's get started. of the world uh, seem to be facing a lot of problems. I mean, uh, countless problems um, for media issues. We talk about social, political, and also geopolitical issues, economic and social issues, foreign policies and the likes. Now, there have been a lot of debates and countless debates, you know, on all these issues, yet there seems to be no uh, way out now. The Which way forward? These are some of the important questions that the audience of the backstory with some of us have even like to she uh, listen to and also address on the show. Now on the backstory with some of us, Stephen. Hi, and my guest. We like to share disruptive mindship conversation on topics and subjects on the on the politics and also government with other subtopics like science and technology, society and culture. Today, now I have uh, Emma Gusey, who is a passionate and dedicated immigration success uh, advocate. Now uh, our mission is to help those who have made the liberals uh, legal journey and here to dream a different reality. Uh, welcome to the show, Ima Kusin. Thank you so much, Amabola. I am so happy to be here this morning. It's morning here in Canada. I know it's probably afternoon there by you, but thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me, Ima. Uh, I'm looking forward to a great time. Uh, I know that you're an uh, immigration and success advocate, and we have a lot to talk about, especially immigration and also migration. So looking forward once again to an absolutely great time. Uh, this is your niche. I wanted you to share with my audience what really leads this back. How did you find yourself in this area of expertise? I grew up in South Africa. So I'm from Africa, as you. But I grew up in a time of turmoil. And it was okay to be targeted because of my skin color. And you know, it's been happening all over the world where different issues occurred. And I was okay. I was okay being targeted. I was okay having to live with a gun under my pillow. I slept with a gun under my pillow. I drove with a gun everywhere I went. I had a gun with me in the office. I had to be accompanied to the washroom all of us ladies, by the other engineers who they were carrying their guns. That was my reality. And I was okay with that. I mean, you know, you have a frog in the water and then you add warm water to it and it's still okay. And eventually it's boiling on the stove. You know that analogy. And it still thinks it's okay. But do not touch our children. And my little girl was two years old when her daycare was attacked in broad daylight by AK-47 wielding attackers. And all those little babies' lives were put in danger. That was me saying, I'm getting out of here. I cannot do this to my daughter. And that's when I moved to the United States. And I lived in Texas for four years. And it was different. Umabola, you know, and you probably know what I'm talking about. But I got there. I didn't know what it was like not to live with a curfew. I didn't know what it was like to be in a country where it's okay to go for a walk with your kids and your dog and family. And then... From there on, we moved to Canada. And you know what? My biggest struggle was how to survive the Canadian winters. Because both in the US and in Canada, we got accepted for who we were. Not based on your race, not based on religion, on politics, but just who were we? as human beings. And then while we were in the US, I realized that we are not gonna survive if we didn't change the way we looked at things. 
And I started working on a concept and I today I call it the connect concept. And that was seven steps, how to integrate not only into society, but also how to educate people, how to really integrate with immigrants. Because legal immigrants are needed all over the world. Our societies are getting older, which means they're taking their education with them. They're taking their skills with them as they retire. And fewer babies are being born. So we as immigrants, as legal immigrants, we pay through our noses to go to our new chosen country. We pay taxes. We contribute to the work economy, to businesses, to the schools. We are helping because we want to fit in. We want to prove that we do belong, that the new country that gave us our homes, that that is where we really fit in. But it's a lot of work on our part. And then, of course, it's work on the government's part as well. But that's another discussion a little bit later on. Now, Ime, um, you talk about um, you being a legal uh, migrant. I really want you to differentiate between legal migration and also illegal migration. What's the difference? With You get different aspects. You get migrants who would move from place to place, country to country. It's like the farmers, the farm workers. They will go all over the world because they want to just work there for a season and then they leave. So they would have a work visa, which make them legal really. And then they will stay there for a short while, but they don't immigrate. Then you get the illegal migrants. And these are the ones that we hear about on the radio and on TV where they get in boats, they get in these um, trucks and they are so desperate for a new life that they will put their lives in danger just to try and move to another country illegally. But the side effect is where legal immigrants have the advantage where you have health care, you have access to being able to work, you have access to schools, you have access to businesses, you are allowed to live in that country. And also with legal immigration, you pay. You pay for lawyers, you pay for your kids to go to schools and universities, you pay for housing, you pay for everything like the long-time residents in a country because you are allowed to be in that country. The only difference, you cannot vote. That is the difference. But so we, we really have three different levels of migration. And People today, they look at immigrants or legal immigrants as a little bit different or separate to the illegal ones, the illegal migrants, and then the migrants who are legal immigrants, but they don't move to the new country to live there. They only work there for a short period. I and hope so that to describe it because you, when, when, when you were talking earlier, uh, uh, you talked about those who are illegal Americans, desperate. Uh, do you want to describe your own situation as also being desperate? Now, looking at your own uh, mm. situation, having, having to move from your own country, South Africa, and now to Texas, and now you're back in Canada. Doesn't mm. this sound desperate? I was desperate. The difference was I wanted to leave legally. I, I made sure before we left, our taxes were paid up. We didn't owe anything. We, we sold everything. We didn't want to owe 
and leave behind things that could maybe later on when you wanted to go back to visit could get you into trouble. So we did go through the lawyers before we left South Africa. We worked with agents and lawyers and companies to be able to have that offer of work to be able to then immigrate to the USA. And then the same happened when we were there to go to Canada. So we were very fortunate that we had the opportunity, we had the skills and the experiences, and that allowed us to be accepted in the American society and as well as in Canada. You cannot be, you cannot immigrate to a new country if you don't adhere to certain criteria. And that includes age, it includes what do you do? Are your skills required? Are they needed in the new country? And also, what are your qualifications? You have to be able to bring that to the table. Why else would a different country allow a stranger basically into their home? You have to prove that you are qualified to be able to live in your new home. Now, how easy is it for uh, immigrants and their families or employees to transition and transform into their new chosen country? I understand the question is that you can bring your families with, right? You can immigrate with your families. Sometimes we do get different countries where only the main breadwinner, even traditionally today, only the main breadwinner will be allowed to go to the new country. And then they have to work to bring the rest of the family. But at the end of the day, everything gets done legally. Everything gets done through lawyers, through the immigration system in the different countries. And to give you an idea, in the U.S., about it's almost 30 percent of the total population currently today are immigrants, legal immigrants. In Canada, the total population is almost 20 percent that are legal immigrants, which gives you an idea of the numbers. However, I want to highlight something here. It is very easy for uninformed government officials to want to allow hundreds of thousands of immigrants legally into the countries without the infrastructure being developed. And we do have that situation currently here in Canada, where your health care, your schools, your work opportunities, and definitely the housing, they are at such dire straits because what is happening in Canada is that only last year, to give you an idea, over 500,000 immigrants were allowed in the country. So those are people with who are legal to be allowed in the country. That does not include your students. So about 800,000 students, international students, got allowed, they got the visas to study in the country. Then you get your migrants your asylum seekers, your refugees, and they made up about 40,000 of the population here. So Canada has a population of 40 million people. Now imagine bringing so many people in. Where is the housing? The schools are overflowing. The health care, which in Canada is universal health care, they do not have enough people. So what happens is if I need to go to an emergency or a walk-in clinic, 
I can wait between four and eight hours to see a doctor. And it is crucial to understand that it's easy to think, oh, but in Canada, for example, healthcare is free. You pay. We, as long-term residents, you pay taxes. We pay the overall population pays in total GST and taxes on this and taxes on that and federal taxes and provincial taxes, almost 50% of our wages. So the governments have to be involved. And that is why I am an advocate for legal immigrants, but also for the governments to understand you need to look at the numbers. You need to take care of your long-time residents and the people who've lived there all their lives because you're doing them a disservice as well as the new people you're allowing into the country. So that is currently a huge, huge situation here. And that is what I talk about when I speak on stages is to educate people to understand. We need advocates. We need to immigration advocates who can educate people about the situations, what's happening that, yes, we want the people in our countries. Yes, we need the skills. Yes, we need the experience immigration officials and lawyers and doctors, we need them. But, but we need to plan it. And it's a harsh thing to say, but it has to be planned. Now, talking about uh, planning, I'd like us to, I'd like you to add to us the issue of immigration policy. What do you think should be the ideal immigration policy at the moment? I think the ideal immigration policies at the moment should be, there should be a committee just for immigration at all government levels. Then those committees should be immigrants. They should be legal immigrants who went to their countries, who started their lives there, who worked there and who brought their skills and experiences. And then they should look at every aspect of the population. Currently, the situation, both in the US and in here in Canada, and I know I did some reading on the UK as well, as well as Europe, we are getting to a point where we're beginning to feel resentful towards anyone who wants to come into our countries. We're beginning to say that, why are these immigrants here? They're taking away my job. They're taking away the healthcare, the doctor from me. They are taking away the school system is now in disrepair because the classes are too full. What are these immigrants doing in my country? Instead of educating the long-time residents and explaining to them, we need immigrants. But also the governments need to control these numbers coming in. Advocacy isn't just about oh yeah, we need to do that. But when you are just a migrant, when you are a refugee, when you are an asylum seeker, when you are a student going into a foreign country, you need to have the rights to be protected. You have to be having the rights to go to someone and say, but my manager, my boss, they are treating me different because I'm an immigrant. Even when you're a legal immigrant, it happens because it's so easy for people to push down these new immigrants who are trying so hard. They want 
to succeed. They want to be accepted and they don't want to be sent back to their countries because they made the choice to leave. They made the choice to pay to leave. So while they are not citizens, there should be governs in place to protect them as well. Ima, do you think that uh, the immigrants really, do you think they have um, rights at all? Do you have any personal experience you'd like to share? That they have, sorry, what at all? Do you think uh, the immigrants have any rights at all? It's tough. It's um, legal, legal immigrants, they do have rights to a certain extent. And it's easy for someone who works at, uh, especially your minimum wage uh, job seekers, to be treated as third, fourth class citizens, because they're not a citizen of the country. They are there on a work visa. They can be replaced. So that pressure is on them the whole time, not to put a foot wrong, not to upset someone, and also not to give any official that reason to send them back out the country. So to some extent, yes, immigrants do have rights. If you're illegal, you have zero because no one knows about you and you will probably get paid under the table and you are going to want to do anything in your power to feed your family. And guess what happens there? The crime rate spikes because they will do anything to feed their children because they're illegal. And it's a vicious, vicious circle that our governments need to stop. They need to look at who are they allowing into the country? Who are they allowing to have certain rights? You know, you're, you're in Canada when you're a refugee or asylum seeker, you do get money from the government and they do put you in a hotel for a certain time only while you are waiting to have the status of refugee or asylum, asylum seeker. After that, you're on your own. So we have people who are then have the legal, in quotation marks, behind their names, but they're living on the streets and they can't find work and they cannot find housing and they cannot put their kids in schools because they have no money. They don't know where to go. So they don't have rights. And then they start working illegally. So as I said earlier, under the they get paid under the table. What happens? They get absolute minimum, minimum wages. So it's something that our governments around the world need to look at. And I believe that the world's richest of the rich people should get involved so that they can then help these governments to look at the overall situation. Because if you are not educated, if you do not know what you don't know, you are going to make the wrong decisions for all the new people you allow into your country. Right. Thanks once again, Eva, for sharing that thought with uh, me. Uh, how do you think that immigration has affected culture? Any insight? Oh, absolutely. Think about it. We are now a smorgasbord of cultures all around us. And when I go to another country, it's up to me to learn the culture. It's up to me to understand 
the customs of the people I connect with. I work with many, many different cultures. And what is good for one is not good for the other. The way you treat one culture is not necessarily the way you will talk to another. Respect is number one. If you don't have respect for not even another person, but for another culture, how can you breed respect for them to have respect for you, for your culture? Now, I don't say that you go into another country and you tell them, you better respect me. This is my religion. This is my culture. You better treat me the way I want to be treated. That doesn't work like that. Going to another country, you are a visitor. You are a stranger. And it's up to you to make sure that you are accepted by showing respect. I am huge, huge on that. You cannot, I cannot go to a Muslim community and be respectful, disrespectful. I cannot. I went to Dubai a few years ago and I worked there. And even though Dubai is quite westernized, they do still have their culture. And it was up to me to respect that culture. I was the stranger. And it was the same In the U.S., it was the same in Canada. It's the same everywhere you go. You are the stranger. You need to work to be accepted to the other people in the country. And, you know, there's so many different cultures. And I think the borders around these cultures probably... They, they fading a little bit. They are not as rigid as they would have been previously. So to keep your own culture, that you don't lose some of it, it's important to make friends with others from the regions where you come from. But it's just as important to grow as a person, as a human being, as a good citizen, to learn about other cultures and to have fun together. You know, I I did a TEDx talk uh, last year in 2023. And I talk about how do you survive immigration? What do you do to adapt when you are the new person in the country? And as I was doing research, I discovered that only in the U.S., alone, and that is not even other countries, approximately, and hold on to your hat here, Omobola, approximately 25% of all public companies backed by public ventures, they have been started by immigrants. And some of these, you might not know, Companies are Google, Yahoo, Intel, eBay. Did you know that? All these companies that are now global and they are conglomerates of so many different cultures, they were started by immigrants like us. So we as immigrants, we don't just want to seek opportunities. Many, many, many times we create them. And that's the cool thing. If the countries are open to change, if they are prepared to give us those opportunities, we can enhance and enrich these countries even more than what they thought they could be. Absolutely, Emir Kusi. Thanks for that. Um, Emir, I'll be rounding up um, shortly, but I'd like you to um, quickly address this question. Now, we have so many people out there all over the world, especially developing countries, who are looking forward, you know, to 
um, migrating to other countries uh, aside their own countries in order to um, look for a uh, greener pastures, uh, becoming, uh, you know, better, you know, having the mindset of, you know, I think life can become better for me where I am heading at. What is your own advice uh, you'd like to share with this um, set of people? I'd like you to uh, use your personal experience to take um, bring home this topic. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. If you plan to leave your country, to immigrate to another country, whether it's for work or school or just seeking a better life, do your research. Do your research. I've done many surveys with immigrants, legal immigrants, and that's the one thing everyone said. Look at the finances, look at where you're going to live, but do your research on the country you want to go to. The other thing, if it's an English-speaking country, start learning English because it will help you in the long run. If I can just mention something quickly, what happens is, is that immigrant families, they immigrate, and then the children almost become the parents because they help the parents to integrate within the community. They help them to understand the customs. So as a family, do your research before the time. Choose where you're going to go. Make sure that your immigration lawyers, that they are reputable. Don't pay thousands and thousands of your country's um, money and of your money to think that they might be decent. So do your research. And that is how when you immigrate, when you get into your new country, you will be prepared for what you then have to face. Thank you once again, Uma Dusina, for sharing your thoughts on today's show, especially talking about migration, immigration issues, absolutely at the great time. Now, Uma Dusina is a passionate and dedicated immigration success advocate. Um, Uma, do you have any projects in the pipeline, any exciting news that you'd like to share with the audience? I am planning to do another TEDx talk this year. So that's my one project, but I work with new immigrants and I do explain to them the soft skills. You know, what do you do? How do you, how do you fit into your new community? And I do work with corporations and companies as well to help them because they all have immigrants. They all bring in immigrants to work at their companies and their groups. And then, of course, speaking on stages, I do continue this education, which I think is so important that people can understand we as immigrants, we are important. We are human beings and we want to succeed in your country. We want to make your country our home because that is humanity. That is what pull us together is to eventually be all be together and just accept one another. Absolutely. Now, how can we connect with you? Social media and this website? Yes, my website is irmagusen.com. And you can connect with me on there. There are um, also uh, a little free gift for if you are thinking how to prepare for a TEDx talk, then you can download that and you can learn what you need to do to have a successful TEDx talk. You, my cousin, you are doing an incredible uh, work indeed. I really appreciate you once again and my uh, audience also do that. I wish you best of luck in the projects that you embark upon. Thank you so much, Omobola, for this opportunity to speak with you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for the work you do. I love your podcast. I love the controversial conversations you have. And I think it is so important to make people think. 
Thank you for that. I appreciate that, Emma Gusin. I'm humbled by your um, feedback. Now, if you'd like to catch up with any missed episodes of the Back Series to Mabola Steven, you can do so on any cross promotion platforms or any distribution platforms. You bump into online, you can just search for like uh, the Back Series with Mabola Steven. I beg, your, I beg your pardon. And here you go. You listen to expert information and share disruptive yet constructive mindset conversation on topics and subjects on the government and politics. Now, I always need you to stay safe, always, with all my love. I talk soon. Thank you, Amapola.